I have a word this morning for us. You know, I've, I've been, as I've been saying, I keep hearing this word, greater glory. Greater glory. And actually, I felt, I begin to search through scriptures on the glory of God and different scriptures I would go through. Just was doing a kind of a word study on that word glory. And uh, this scripture really spoke to me. And I wanted to share it actually at the New Year's Eve service, but then I knew I wouldn't have enough time to go through it, and so I saved it, and I've been studying it, and I've been drinking a lot of coffee while studying it. <laughs> so get ready with your notebooks this morning, because there's a lot that is going to be downloaded, and I pray that it will feed your soul, strengthen your spirit this morning, and give you clear direction for the year ahead. Amen. Psalm 24. The, Lord, the earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure who do not worship idols and never tell lies, they will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. According to your word, Father, we declare over every heart, over every family, over every life, over every person in his place. Under the sound of my voice, open up, O ancient gates. Open up, O ancient doors, and let the King of glory come in. As a church, we declare over Malaysia, open up, O ancient gates. Open up, O ancient doors. Let the King of glory come in. Come into our schools. Come into our education system, to our justice system. Come in, we ask, upon the streets, the highways and the byways come in pour out your spirit in a greater measure we believe God according to your word that these are the last days and according to your word you said you will pour out your spirit upon all flesh that sons and daughters will prophesy that old men will dream dreams and young men will see in vision we declare over every life and every heart that the spirit of the Lord is upon you as I said over Sebastian, I say over you, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of counsel, of might, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of knowledge, and a spirit of the fear of the Lord. We thank you for an open heaven among us. We thank you that angels ascend and descend in this place. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the gate of heaven. This is the house of the Lord, and we rejoice in you. Oh God of the heavens, King of glory, the one who is mighty to save, we fix our eyes on you. We say, have your way, have your way. In our hearts, we have ears to hear. Oh, open the eyes of our understanding to see what you are seeing to do, what you intend to do upon the earth. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I love how this psalm poses the question, who is the king of glory? It is a question of the ages. Unbelievers would mock, who is the king of glory? Many times we as believers, when we go through a time of testing and of trial, we would cry out, who is the king of glory? 
And the word of God says the king of glory is mighty. That the king of glory is invincible in battle. That the king of glory is the Lord of heaven's armies. That is who we worship. That is who we praise. He is the word who became flesh, who dwelt among us, who revealed the heart of the Father, a heart of grace and truth. He is the firstborn of all creation. Everything was created by Him and through Him and for Him and all things have been put under subjection under His feet. Feet. Who is the King of Glory? He is before all things. He holds all things together. He upholds all things by the word of His power. Who is the King of Glory? You ask. He is the one who cancelled our certificate of death. He has taken it out of the way and He nailed it to the cross. He disarmed every principality. Come on, every power, every ruler, every authority that is against. Against the name of Jesus, he made a public spectacle of them. He triumphed over them at the cross. Who is the king of glory? Come on, he's the one that God has highly exalted and given the name that is above every name. Come on, let's give him glory. He is the king of glory, the name that is above every name. Every name on earth, every name in heaven, every name under the earth and at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the King of glory. Amen. And as the King of glory enters in, no demon can stand against him. No devil can prevail against him. No wall can keep him down. No chain can shackle him. Not even death and the grave can limit him because he is God who is mighty. He is God of heaven's armies. And it's no small thing, church, when we come together to praise, when we come together to pray and begin to intercede and begin to declare that name. And even in our giving, it says, it opens up ancient gates. It opens up ancient doors so that the king of glory can come in. I believe with all of my heart that we are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. We are called to Malaysia for such a time as this and the call has gone out. That call has your name on it and it's whether you are willing to rise up. Like Mordecai said to Esther, you have been called. The call is on your life. Will you step up to the plates? His call is upon this church to open up ancient gates, to open up ancient doors so that the King of Glory can step into hospital rooms, that the King of Glory can step into prison cells, the King of Glory can step into drug dens, the King of Glory can step into school rooms, the King of Glory can step into every area of this nation, every highway and every byway. That the gospel is preached with greater ease. That miracles will be the new norm. Amen. That the king of glory wants to enter in and he enters in through ancient gates and ancient doors. Turn to your neighbor and say ancient gates. Turn to your other neighbor beside you and say ancient doors. <laughs> Notice these are ancient. Meaning it was set up before you and I ever came around. And we may not have been here when these gates were established, but I believe we will certainly be here when we sing them fling wide open by the power of God. What are these ancient gates? Gates in ancient times had many functions. Everything that was important was held at the gates. Kings held their audiences at the gates. Elders set to discuss important matters at the gates. Prophets would prophesy at the gates. Cases were heard, judgments were passed, laws were read, battles were fought at the gates. It represents a place of power. A city's security depended on the strength of a gate. Attackers who made a breach 
In the gates of a city were assured of victory. It was a symbol of strength and of power. And it's the same in the spirit world. Gates represents a place of power, a place of strength, a place of influence. It is a legal access point of entry between the earthly realm and the spirit realm. The ancient gates are spiritual gates which grant access into a life, into a city, into a family, into a nation. Now, how are these gates set up? We see in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is on the run. He's running from his family. He's done a lot of mistakes. His brother's out to kill him, and so he's on the run. And as he runs, he gets tired. It's night. He falls asleep, and he dreams. In this dream, this is what he sees. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, he says, Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, Notice that. And its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So there's all these angelic activities. Angels notice they're going up on assignment and coming back down. Going up on assignment and coming back down. And at the top, God himself speaks to Jacob and God begins to bless him. And God begins to pronounce his destiny over his life. And Jacob wakes up in verse 16 and he says, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Heaven has gates. Heaven has gates. Psalms 100 says what? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The presence of God is access through gates. Notice the gates of heaven was set up on the earth. With its top that's reaching to the heaven. Why? Because God has given the earth realm to mankind. We have the authority here on earth to connect earth with heaven and heaven with earth. So who set up this gate? Obviously, it wasn't Jacob. Jacob was unaware that this place was holy. He has no idea he's running from his brother and he thinks it's a coincidence. But if you study deeper into this portion of scripture, you will understand that in Genesis 12, his grandfather built an altar on this very ground, in this very place, in Bethel. And I want to prophesy over every parent here who has a wayward child. You may think that your child is running away from the things of God, from the plans of God for his life. But let me tell you, because of the altar that you have raised, because of the prayers that you have prayed, because of the tears that you have cried in the presence of the Lord, because of your sacrifice for the kingdom of God, because of the altar that you have raised, your child will run straight into an encounter with God. And he will run straight straight into the kingdom of God, that she will run straight into the destiny that God has, the purpose that God has for his and for her life. That the very ground of rebellion and sin and shame will be the very ground that is made holy when the king of glory enters in. Every parent said, amen, amen. And I want to speak to the church. We have a responsibility and an obligation to build an altar. To build an altar that will bring a blessing that will, will sustain the generations to come. This is not just about us today. This is about our children that will sit on the very same seats you are sitting in. Your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, the people that will come in. Children from afar, spiritual children who will sit here and will lift their hands and worship God and give their lives to Him. We have an obligation. We have a responsibility to build an altar of prayer and of praise. Altars is a place of encounter. It is a place of sacrifice, forgiveness, worship. It's a place of covenant, of intercession. Altars open unseen gates and doors, highways into the realm of the spirit. Like gates, altars attract spiritual traffic depending on who built them. Once spiritual highways are open, they can either become the gates of hell 
which releases curses over the earth or the gates of heaven, which releases the blessing of God. Remember Balak, he was a king, um, uh, from, a king of Moab. He was, it's, a, it's an incredible story. It's in Numbers 23. Go back and read it. And so he, he's threatened by the nation of Israel. He calls on this prophet Balaam. He's quite a unique character. He wasn't an Israelite. And Balaam says, okay, I'll come down and curse this nation that you want. You know, it's all about the money for him. He says, but you built me seven altars. And so they were preparing seven altars for him. But before he comes down to pronounce a curse, God stops him, he intervenes and says, you don't curse whom I have blessed. And so instead of cursing, he pronounces a blessing. But notice they set up altars. Hell has gates. Matthew 16 verse 18, you know, this was when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you think I am? And Peter stands up and says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, you know, that's awesome. You are Simon, now you are Peter. And that word Peter means Petros. And he says, on this rock, and that word rock comes from the word Petra. He says, you are Petros, but on this Petra, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what is he saying? Based on this confession that I am the Messiah, that I am the Son of God, this is the bedrock on which I'm going to build my church and the power of hell, the strength of hell will not limit it. It will not be able to hinder what I'm going to do through the church in the earth. He continues on to say, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in the heaven. He's giving us as a church keys. Keys to open and unlock and to lock and unlock ancient doors, ancient gates to release the glory of God upon the earth to release his goodness, to release his peace, to release his wisdom, to release his might, to release his power. He has given us the authority, church. Some of us may think, oh, maybe he gave it to Peter. No, he repeats this two chapters later and he's speaking to his disciples, all of them who were there. And he says the same thing. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. And in verse 19, he goes on to amplify what he said earlier to them. He said, again, I say to you that if two of you agree, if two of you agree on earth, Concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Incredible. Incredible. What a promise. Turn to your neighbor and say, just you and me, baby. It's just you and me. If you're sitting next to your husband, next to your wife, come on. It's just you and me, darling. That's all we need. To see generational curses broken, come on. To see the kingdom of God revealed over our generation. It's just you and me. It just takes two people. Come on, it's all we need. If you can come into a place of agreement and all it takes is just you and me. We're going to see the kingdom of God explode on the earth like nothing we have ever seen before. That's why the enemy comes so hard against marriages. That's why he comes so hard against unity in a team. Imagine if two of us were to agree, how much more 10 of us at a connect group on a Friday evening? How much more hundreds of us on a Sunday morning? Imagine what we're able to do if we are united in heart and in spirit. It's no small thing. We carry the keys of the kingdom. And as we come together to praise, to pray, to give of our offerings, to lift up the name of Jesus, we are building an altar and we are able to shut up the heavens and we're able to open up the heavens over lives, over families, over nations like Elijah, who was able to shut up and to open, to pronounce judgment on the enemies of God. But let me bring it home to this. And this is my assignment today. As much as God is all about opening ancient gates through this house, He is passionate about opening ancient gates in this house. Upon this altar. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, it says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of God? Your body is the house of God. This is where the gates of heaven reside. And this is where it's open up. Who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Every human heart has an invisible altar, a place where we meet with God. God wants to renew our commitment today to build an altar, to build an altar of prayer. Don't be busy, so busy with life and the good things of life and work and all that God has blessed you. He's, remem he's reminding you today, build me an altar, a place where you will meet with me in daily surrender, in daily forgiveness, in daily worship, in daily prayer. And the thing about this altar is that the sacrifice is you. We don't bring a cow, we don't bring a calf, we don't bring a bull, we don't bring a lamb. The sacrifice is me. You see, there's altering at the altar. It's not about bless me, bless me, bless me. It's also about change me. It's also about mold me. It's also about deal with me. Areas of my life that is not pleasing before you, I am the living sacrifice at the altar. Have your way. Have your way. I want to see more of your glory in my marriage. I want to see more of your glory through the faces of my children. I want to see more of your glory in my business. I want to see more of your glory in my life. Have your way. Whatever is limiting the king of glory from stepping into my world, God have your way. Deal with it. And God's very specific about building an altar. How do we build an altar? Go back to Psalm chapter 24. In verse 1 it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the, found, the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depth. So number one, just two points. Number one, living under the authority of heaven. Notice when the patriarchs built an altar, they had all sorts of gods that they could bow down to. But when they built an altar, they're saying, you are my God. My life is in your hands. I live according to your purpose, to your calling, to your plan for my life. I'm bringing my life in submission to your will. Why? Because he made us. We don't belong to ourselves. He made us. I said to the musicians, you know, uh, last Saturday, we want to open up ancient gates over the hearts and minds of people as they step in on a Sunday morning. And it's not about how loud we can shout on a microphone or how loud we can bang on a drum. Although those are incredible and beautiful expressions of worship, but it takes authority. It takes authority to open up ancient gates. And in order to have authority, we first must come under authority. What did the centurion say? He says, no, Jesus, you don't need to even come and lay your hand on my servant. You don't need to be even under my roof. You just need to say the word. And it's done. Because he recognized that Jesus had authority on his life because he was under the authority of heaven. God is not the author of confusion. Let me remind you that we are under his authority. He is the Lord. He is king over our lives. And let me just push it in a little bit deeper. And I'm going to say this. The authority that God has placed here on earth is authority that we are submitted to. In order to build an altar that is holy and pleasing before the Lord, we need to also not just have come under His authority, but come under the authority of whom He has placed here on earth. You know, the scripture says, uh, how can anyone say they love God and yet hates his brother and sister? He says, you're a liar if you say that. Now, those are strong words. Because whoever doesn't love his brother or sister who they can see, how are they going to love God who they can't see? And it's so true when you think about it, right? If my love for, for someone, you know, either my close friend, my husband, my children is up one day, down another day. I'm angry one day. I'm happy one day. I'm pleased one day. I'm disappointed the next day. It's a reflection of my heart towards God. One day I'm happy with God. Next day I'm disappointed with God. 
I don't have the capacity to love in the way I'm supposed to love with a full heart. The true test of my love for God is how I love others. In the same way, the true test of how I'm submitted to God, to His authority, is how I'm submitted to those whom God has placed over my life. That's how we know if we're really under authority, that we're really submitted. The Bible talks about citizens to yield, to submit to kings and rulers. Children to parents, wives to husbands, husbands to Christ, youth to their elders, church to its leaders. Romans chapter 13 verse 1, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we submit ourselves to God? That is by submitting to the authority of his written word. If you say you submit yourself to God, are you obeying what His Word says? And submit to the authority of whom He has placed on earth. In order to have authority, in order to walk in authority, we must first learn what it is to come under authority. Amen? My second point, verse 3 in Psalm 24, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. And then it breaks it down to these two uh, ideas. Who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. So the first one is living under the authority of heaven and the second one is pursuing a lifestyle of purity. Pursuing a lifestyle of purity. The question is, who can? Climb up the mountain of the Lord. Who can stand before Him? And the answer is right there. The person who has clean hands and a pure heart. So how do we attain it? You know, some of us are like, you know, I give a lot to the poor pastor, you know. I'm very good-hearted, you know. I, 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 I try to do what is right, you know. I, I try to stay away from what is bad. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pure-hearted pastor. My hands are clean pastor. And the thing is, we compare how good we are in our works based on that fellow over there. You know, he. <laughs> you know, she. <laughs> I'm much better than him. I'm much better than her. But the truth is, the standard is not according to him or her. The standard of holiness is according to him. And when you compare your life and your action and your heart and your motives to him, then we're in serious trouble. And so God saw the gap. And he made a way where there was no way. And he sent his own son to come into the world, to die and take our place, our punishment for sin. Jesus took it on the cross. He paid the price. He didn't just die for us. He rose victorious so that we can come to the cross and we can exchange our sin and our imperfection and our filth and our shame. For His holiness, for His perfection, for His purity. Thank you, Jesus, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Ephesians 2 verse 8, it is by grace we have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. So now we have received His forgiveness. We stand in His righteousness. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we are forgiven. Now go, He says, and sin no more. How we live matters. It matters to him. 
He says all through scripture, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, be holy for I am holy. He says, I have set you apart. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You belong to me. You are my own possession. And we need to guard these two areas of our life. As studying this, I realized that these are like gates over our hearts. Two areas he mentions, don't worship idols. What is an idol? Very simply, it's something that you think you could never be happy if you never had it. It could be good things, it could be, it could be success, it could be sex, it could be fame and fortune, and it could be a marriage. If I never get married, I'm not going to be happy with life. If I never have children, I'm never going to be satisfied with life. Now let me ask you this. What if everything was taken away? What if there was nothing? What if there was no one? What if you never got married, you never had a child, you never got that race, you drove your old beat up proton for the rest of your life? <laughs> Would you get mad at God? Would you get disappointed? Would you get... Angry, how do we guard our hearts from allowing false idols to sit on? We must guard the eye gate. Turn to your neighbor and look them in the eye and say, guard those eyes. Guard those eyes. In Matthew chapter 6, 22, the eye is the lamp, the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body is full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So what he's trying to say is like the spiritual eyes, which is your heart. It's very similar to our natural eyes, right? If our eyes are able to see clearly, then if we can see the longkang right in front of you, we can see the tiny wooden bridge there and we're able to walk across to safety. But if your eyes are bad, your eyes can't see properly, then you just very easily fall into the longkang and then get all bruised and battered. And it's not just your eyes that get hurt, it's your entire being, it's your entire body, right? So it's the same with the spirit. Your eye is a gate and it can be used by the enemy or it can be used by God and it can bring a blessing or it can bring a curse over your life. And what God is saying is if we spend our lives oblivious to his kingdom and what we only see and meditate on and run after is the things of the world, the things of this, this, this life that is here, then our eye is bad. And subsequently, our whole body will be full of darkness because we invest our treasure and exhaust ourselves in vain pursuit of sad rewards. Earthly glory and earthly praises from men. Our hearts and all we treasure will be eaten up by moth destroyed by rust, stolen by thieves. Money will become our master. But if our eyes are clear and we perceive the reality of God, God's kingdom, then our whole body will live according to this truth. It will act to win the reward of our heavenly father who is unseen in the secret place. It will lead our heart upward toward heaven, storing up treasures in heaven. And it will seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of right living. And subsequently, our whole body will be full of light. And that will lead to a life that has the most possible reward and fulfillment in this life and as well as the life to come. I pray over every heart. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. In the LLT, it says be filled with light that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? The eye is a gate over our lives, church, that we must possess. We must possess in order to keep our hearts pure and disallow any idol, anything else but Jesus to sit on the throne of our hearts. So the first gate is the gate of the eye, which is the, the eyes of our heart. The next gate is we need, that we need to possess, as we see in Psalm 24, is the gate of our mouth. 
He talks about speaking no lies. And I'm going to dig in a little deeper in this. And I'm going to say this. If we speak anything that is not based on the truth of God's word, they are lies of the enemy. They are lies of the enemy. If we speak words of hopelessness, of anger, of bitterness, of shame, of jealousy, of malice, you are partnering not with the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of hell and releasing curses over your own life, over your own finances, over your own health, over your own destiny. Bring the gate of our mouth before the Lord and allow him to cleanse us. Matthew chapter 15 verse 11 says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. You notice just one small gate and it affects your entire life. James 3 verse 6 says this, And the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. Verse 9, with it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. There's a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You know, when we bring our children to the doctor, what will the doctor say? Ah, open your mouth, stick out your tongue. And he can see a lot. He can tell the health of a child based on the condition of his mouth. It's the same for us. It's the same in the spiritual realm. What comes out of our mouth is an accurate reflection of our heart. Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of us have shut the door of heaven over our lives because of the things that we have pronounced, the judgments that we have made over our lives and over people. Instead of releasing the blessing of God, we have released curses. We believe the lie of the enemy that there is no hope for the situation. Die, 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 la. Gone, 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 la. Pain, 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 la. We need to guard the gate of our mouth. We need to guard our hearts. We need to shut the door to the enemy once and for all. I will not allow a single word out of my mouth that does not align with the truth of God's word. And watch how your life transform. Hebrews 12 verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, become dirty, become muddied, become soiled. When we allow bitterness to come out of our hearts and our mouths, we muddy our hearts, we muddy our hands. How do we cleanse them? By returning to the altar by repenting at the altar, by confessing the truth of God's word. What did Jesus say? Sanctify them, purify them, make them holy. How? Purify them by the cleansing of your word. Your word is truth. Replace the lie with the truth. Speak forth the word of God over your children, over your health, over your mind, over your finances, over Malaysia, over our government, over your marriage, over your destiny. Speak the word of the Lord. I'm going to close with this scripture, James chapter 1 verse 18. Out of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. We began our journey by the word. That we might be the kind of first fruits of his creature. And verse 19, so then my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, jangan cakap banyak lah. Jangan lah. Jangan. And slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Watch over the gate of your mouth, church. Keep our hands and our hearts pure. Build an altar that is worthy to receive the King of glory. And as we do that, our lives, not just a Sunday morning, but a Friday night. Not the Thursday night prayer meeting, but a Tuesday early morning when the house is chaotic and the children are climbing the walls. We live a life that is pleasing before the Lord. We present our bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence. There is unhindered communion in the glory of God as we come to His altar day after day and say, purify my life, purify my heart, cleanse my mind. Oh, may my actions, the meditation of my heart be pleasing before you. And as you do that, gates begin to open up. And the King of Glory steps in. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is the King of Glory? Hallelujah. We worship you. We honor you. We bless you. We're going to partake of communion. And if you know the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and touching on a certain area of your life, as He has done to me, let's confess. Let's repent. Let's rebuild the altar. Ashes can pass out the bread and the cup. Let's examine our hearts before the Lord. Have your way. We yield, we surrender. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My life is on the altar surrender to you every part of me cleanse me once again just speak to God in your own way say Father I repent repent of every careless word I've said things said and done in anger out of jealousy out of malice felt hopelessness in my heart but the truth is you are God of hope and I have no right to speak anything outside of your truth out of your word forgive me God we come to your throne of grace once again your throne of grace and mercy we receive forgiveness we receive mercy we receive the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus over our hearts, over our lips, over our hands. Cleanse the Spirit of God. Not by mind or by power. But by your Spirit, set people free today. Every form of blindness, spiritual blindness, be broken over the hearts and minds of people in the name of Jesus. Set captives free today. Those who are bound by oppression, those who have allowed the work of the enemy to come into their life, those who have allowed a foothold to the enemy, we break its power in the name of Jesus and we arrest every unclean spirit. You do not belong in a believer's life. I bind you in the name of Jesus and I cancel your power over a believer's life. I renounce that the gates of hell shall prevail against them. Your word said that you will build your church.
church, then the gates of hell shall not prevail. And so I declare that every curse is broken by the power and the blood of Jesus. I declare that the gates of heaven is in the believer's heart and lives and it is in operation today that we will see angels ascend and descend on assignment that the King of glory may enter in. We declare ancient gates be opened up over this region, over Malaysia, over our families and over our lives. We cancel and break every generational curse in the name of Jesus. We arrest every lie. Be broken in the name of Jesus. We release the power of God upon every life, upon every heart. The peace of God shall guard your mind and your heart. Hallelujah. We look to you. We look to you. God of strength. King of glory, enter in. If you have not given your life to Jesus, just call upon that name. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. Come into my heart, I yield to you. I can never attain holiness in my own works. I depend on what you have done for me. Come and cleanse me. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Father. For the blood of Jesus that cleanses. For your spirit that has been poured out. In the name of Jesus, let's partake of the blood.